gather together, the conversation gets boring. And, uh, <laughs> we, were, we were right there in the weeds having the best time ever, and Bill said, get going. So, all right, here we are. Uh, part two. <laughs> what a very enthralling sort of title, but anyway. Uh, part two, so here we go. Uh, let me remind you, because I didn't know when I wrote this, I didn't know I'd be back to back, so I thought there might be other speakers in between. So, here we go. My wife's moving this along. We'll be just like an iceberg. We're talking about above the surface, below the surface, and now we're going to talk about stuff deep below. In fact, these things often hide behind values that are higher up the iceberg that are still deep values. Um, so, uh, these are hard to see, but uh, I think they're... Uh, like our virtues and vices, our rules and relationships, these things often hide behind uh, more obvious values. Like our, you know, when Jesus talks about, you know, I often do peace and salvation. Uh, you know, he, he, was, he was saying, you got a choice between two kings. Okay, you want to follow Caesar, you want to follow me. Now he offers, absolutely offers peace and salvation. He offers other things too. He takes those two because he's contrasting himself to Caesar. By the way, we voted up that passage in Matthew something about the coin, where he says, uh, give to Caesar things that are Caesar. It's like some things belong to Caesar, and some things belong to God. Everything belongs to God. Okay, and Jesus knew that. He won the debate when the guy pulls out the coin. Because why are there money changers? Because you're not supposed to have graven images. So he says, uh, Whose image is that? Whose inscription? <laughs> oh, the guy's going to have egg all over his face. Because it's an image of Caesar that says, Divine Caesar Iberius. So he's told them, oh yeah, this thing that I'm not supposed to have in the temple. And his point is, why does he have a Roman coin? So while they're under Rome, you can have a Tiberian, I mean a uh, Tyronean shekel. There are lots of other coins around. So why use a Roman coin? Because Roman coins were honest. Uh, a common way to, uh, coins were bullion. You know what I mean by that? In other words, a denarius, a silver denarius, had a silver's worth of denarius in it. You could melt it down, it's worth the same thing. What? A, uh, sorry, a denarius is worth a silver. Thank you. So, uh, so here's one way you could make a little money. You could shave a coin, shave a little, go around it a couple times, it'd be slightly smaller. Maybe no one would notice. And you get a little pot into that, and you've got yourself some money. Or you could be more obvious and just clip a corner off. It's called clipping. And uh, they clipped and shaved coins all the time. In our history, we had two coins that were bullion, quarters and dimes. And so we put ridges on the outside to keep people from shaving them back in those days. That's why our coins, those coins had ridges. Okay, they couldn't mint that well back then. Couldn't stand that well. So, how do you keep your coins honest? Well, you tell people, don't do that. The Romans had another way. If you were shaving coins, they would kill you. <laughs> and your family, and your neighbors, because they figured your neighbors knew about it. Because, as you point out, in villages, everybody knows what everybody's doing. Okay? And then sometimes they would decimate meaning you killed one out of every ten. In, the in other words, they made it to where you just didn't shave or clip Roman coins. So people used them because Caesar enforced them with the sword. They liked safe roads. They liked pirate-free Mediterranean because if Rome met a pirate, they would just set their ships on fire. Okay? And that took care of that. And so they enforced it. And so uh, Jesus recognizes they like honest money. He says there's two ways to have honest money. Caesar's way or God's way. So, hey, you know, in the kingdom of God, they won't have police. Okay, why? Because we won't cheat each other. So it's not. So um, all of that went without being said. So Jesus doesn't explain this point because everybody knew what he meant. All right, so here we go. I'm supposed to talk. All this stuff, I, I can have a side that was free. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, all these things go without being said. And the further down, the harder they are to detect. Most of these we learned as a child. Like those are very So um, we would need to show more time than we have how we get to this stuff and how it works, but they're hidden deep below the surface. And when people would talk about the misreading book, they would say, Oh, we love the last three sections. We wish you'd written more about that. Well, if we hadn't gotten them there, 
by going through the first two sections, they might not have bought the stuff we were explaining in the last session. In fact, I'm a little worried we've gone too fast on this one. But, you know, I hate to say take my word for it, but they, they go without being said. So we'll we'll take a look at some stuff. Virtues and vices. Now these are not, um, I'm not talking about biblical virtues. They don't change. Local vices, they don't change. Okay, But American ones, in my case, Texas virtues. Um, <laughs> In Texas, it might, it's nearly a legal defense to say he needed killing. Okay. So it's, you know, you just have these virtues that are cultural virtues. So let's take a, a look at a common New Testament virtue. By, oh, by the way, I mentioned my name. Um, a common New Testament virtue, sharing. Okay, that's Christian. Okay, sharing is Christian. Um, Jesus wants us to share. I don't know that you can even get a whole Bible study out of that. Okay. Maybe with little kids. But generally, if your sermon is on Jesus wants us to share, it's going to be a short sermon, okay? Because um, everybody thinks, yeah. All right. Here's my uh, little picture of confused. Uh, we live in South Florida in urban and we have you know, panhandlers there. And so my little students will be all conflicted because the scouts say, hey, it's in the spirit of God. And, uh, And I say, what should I do? And I think, why is this so hard for a, a Christian student? Well, it's the fault of the little red hen. Okay. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about, and a lot of you don't. So I'm going to give you a crash course in the little red hen. Okay? It's a children's book. How many of you, by the way, grew up having your mom or somebody read you the little red hen? Anybody? Okay. So there you go. This, this book is deep. Not theological, okay, but it is deeply buried in the American worldview. By the way, so is Cinderella. Okay, in fact, every one of my students who explains how they met their their fiance, it ends up sounding like Cinderella. You know, oh, he pursued me. Okay, now that's stalking. No. <laughs> one of my friends, Scott Duvall, who wrote the book Grasping God's Word, great. His wife said, oh, Scott, pursue me. I said, you asked him out on the first day. Yes, but. But then she rewrites the whole thing. It has to come out Cinderella. Okay? It has to come out Cinderella. It's deeply buried in the American worldview. So is Little Red Hint. So here we go. Fast forward. There were once four friends, okay? Um, and one day Little Red Hint finds some seeds, okay? So she says, who will help me plant these seeds? Okay? Not I says the pig, not I says the duck, not I says the cat. Okay. So I'll plant the seeds at the end, she does. Okay. The seeds sprout, grow. She asks her friends, who'll help me get by the way, I, I have a root yet. Because it's who's gonna help me weed the garden? Not I, not I, who will have those of you know the story, go oh, no, 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 no. But you're a little kid, you love this, okay. But every time it's not I, not I, not I, say her friends, okay. Who'll help me cut these stalks of wheat? Not I, not I, not I, say her friends. Friends, okay. Little red friends. Who'll help me grind the grains into flour? Okay, boy. And you think this is long? I have a good idea. Okay. Little red says, "Who'll help me make this flour into bread?" Not I. Not I. Not I. Okay. And so I'll make the flour into bread, and she did. Okay. So then she called her friends. Who'll help me eat this bread? I will. I will. I will. And she says, "No, I'll eat the bread." Now, <laughs> and she did it. <laughs> <laughs> when I asked this, my, my students are conflicted. <laughs> Here you go. Here's a great image of conflicted. Okay. <laughs> Y'all know this image? This kind of, I know you probably, as soon as I've all seen the cartoon, but um, this is what happens when the panhandler asks them if, if they can spare a dollar. Up pops the little Jesus figure. Um, you should help them. You should shoot them. Up pops the little right hand. Those who don't help should not get to, uh, should not get it. Okay. And you think, what should I do? What should I do? Well, Jesus wouldn't want us to give. Oh, well, wait, wait, wait. So we need a Bible verse quick. 
This is the only verse in 2 Thessalonians that my students know. They've never read 2 Thessalonians. Okay? The only way, they only know where it is because they know it comes after 1 Thessalonians. So they go, oh, he who does not work. That's the verse they know. So they run right past all of the verses that Jesus has about sharing. And they pull out a verse that Paul gives, a practical verse. Paul. Now they don't quote any of the other ones out of it. They wouldn't want any of the other ones out of that section of 2 Thessalonians. But they want that one. Why? Because that verse in 2 Thessalonians agrees with a little bit of it. And we love it when Bible verses agree with our worldview. I said that in the correct way. We love it when we can find Bible verses that agree with our worldview. So, let's just move on past that whole virtue. Okay, so rules versus relationships. Now, not the biblical ones, okay, but American ones. And uh, like this one, obey your parents, right? At least till you're uh, 18. Um, this is a hard one for us because in the West, rules are very important. Uh, I may have understood that. Now, those of you who are from the East, you know this. Wow, Westerners are just Nazis about the rules. Okay. Um, we think the whole universe is controlled by rules. Okay. Now, when I was the age of my college students, uh, physics had rules. Okay. And then along came chaos, theory, which is basically there aren't any rules. So now, what are we trying to do? We don't jettison the whole rule thing. We're now trying to figure out the rules of chaos. <laughs> uh, a few days ago when I was at Oxford, they showed us this is where Newton discovered gravity. But you know, we actually haven't discovered gravity. We still know what gravity is. I don't know we have no idea what gravity is. Newton described gravity. Things fall. Okay. Um, <laughs> but even though we have no idea what gravity is, we are 100% confident it has rules. Now, we don't know what it is, we don't know what the rules are, but we know that it has them. Why? Because everything has rules. Okay, gravity has rules, institutions have rules. You know, we figured out, okay, this is what makes plants grow. Here's what you do to make plants grow better. But if that works for plants, it should work for churches. <laughs> so we have the rules for church growth. <laughs> Okay, and we think even people follow rules. So, we have the seven steps to a happy marriage, for instance. I told my son who got married, he saw his picture of his wife. She was a gift. Um, and it's not true. But anyway, uh, if somebody promised you the seven rules for happy marriage, run away. <laughs> run away. Um, but, you know, everything has rules. So we had a helper in Indonesia named Sonia. What a gift from the Lord Jesus. Anyway, uh, so I'm trying to figure this whole thing out. So, okay, what time does what time do you come to work, Sonia? Well, it's up to you, uh, which means father. It's up to you. Okay, well, um, so you come. I don't know, eight or seven uh, so what time do you go home? Well, it's up to you. Um, she kept defining it as a relationship. Um, and I wanted the rules. We even tried to define our relationship with God about us. Forensic justification. We describe discipleship by rules. When that when we do, what we end up with is justification by faith and sanctification by works. And we're not allowed to say that. Um, um, when you meet a new believer, how do I grow in the Lord? Well, you read your Bible, and you go to church, and we list off all these um, rules. Uh, the Bible uh, prefers relationships over rules. So when they describe our relationship to God, they use adoption. Um, something everybody, by the way, in the world back then understood. So uh, Indonesians define the things the same way. Sonia called me father. 
So when did she come? And you know, when I wanted her to. How long she worked? You know, when I wanted to. Who paid her medical bills? Well, her father did. She has children. Who helps with their education? Well, what kind of a lousy father wouldn't help with the education of his grandchildren? Who call me Opa? Um, the point is, Paul used relationships rather than rules to explain our relationship with God. Everyone understood adoption. Everyone understood this term, Patagogos, which was the name of a slave. And this slave was in charge of the heir of the household. So uh, his job was to make sure the heir got to school on time. Uh, we have some stories where they have a big, long long skinny okay, say like a switch and they would stand in the back and if the air started nodding off in class they'd reach over and whack them on top of the head uh, to wake them up they could paddle the air and all kinds of other disciplines but when that air came of age that pedagogos is now the slave in this household the child who was under the authority of the Pentecost is now the master. Say, so, okay, well, it's great. Paul said, that's the way the law is for believers. The law was given until Christ came, when we became of age. Um, by the way, we generally like being under the law because it's easier than this. 10% belongs to the Lord. The, Old Testament. the New Testament, everything belongs to the Lord. Why don't we give you back the 10? Um, <laughs> if 10% belongs to the Lord, who does the 90% belong to? That's, that's why we like the Sabbath. It's the Lord's Day. So the other six days are. Every day Patrons and clients, which my buddy will talk about uh, later. Um, but Paul used to patrons gave gifts to people who didn't deserve it. Your your bakery burns down because something <laughs> happens when you run a bakery. Um, it's burned down. You don't have any money to rebuild. You go see a wealthy person and you say, "Could you help me?" Well, they don't have to help you. And they say, "Okay, I'll give you this gift. I'll rebuild your bakery." Well, now you're the client and you're supposed to be loyal to that patron. Does that make sense? So you bake bread for him and for his families and all of his clients. He makes sure you're paid an honest wage. He takes two you out of trouble with you. That would make sense. Um, the gift the patron gave was called charis, which we translate to grace. The loyalty that the client felt for the patron was called pistis, which we translate to faith. The only time in the ancient world Grace and faith are used together is to describe the relation between the faith and the So he gives us a gift we don't deserve, and we're supposed to be loyal to return. Where are the rules today? Uh, here we go. So, the problem with what goes without being said, in my culture, okay, what goes without being said about rules? Oh, here you go. In my culture, rules apply to everybody equally. We won't state that, but that's just, it's a given. Everybody knows that. Rules apply to everybody equally. Or, it's unfair. Okay? If it don't apply to everybody equally, then that rule is unfair. Okay? And they apply all the time. Okay? If the rule doesn't apply all the time, then it's broken. Okay? Now that goes without being said. Here's where it gets fun. God isn't broken, and he's not unfair. Okay? Therefore, his rules apply to everybody equally. So God can't give you one rule and give me another. <laughs> well, that should make us say, okay, well, it's different. No, we just think both of us. So, he tells the rich young ruler, you have to sell everything you have. And follow me. Peter, he doesn't require him to sell. Peter still owns the fishing business in John 21. Well, see, to us, that sounds like that's unfair. Paul says, 
I was set apart in my mother's womb. Well, if Paul was set apart in his mother's womb, what about me? What about you? We all were set apart in our mother's womb. The problem is when Paul says that, he seems to be saying, I'm different. Um, the only other people, Isaiah and Jeremiah, were set apart in their mother's womb. Paul thinks he's another Isaiah and another Jeremiah. And Paul does. Okay. Um, since God isn't broken or unfair, his rules apply all the time. So God can't give a rule that doesn't apply all the time. Uh, Joshua leads the people into the promised land. I love it. It's a great story. He tells Joshua, be strong and be courageous. Tells him that like three or four times. Be strong and be courageous. First thing he does, he sends spies into the land to figure out what's going on. Well, that's being strong and courageous. <laughs> okay, but anyway, the, uh, they're going to go and take the promised land. Every Hebrew gets land. All the Canaanites, they don't get land. First story is a Canaanite who gets land. Rahab. Second story, a Hebrew who doesn't get land. Achan. You know, you're kind of making a point if your first two points are exceptions to the group. Um, so how did I learn that Easterners, at least where I worked, had a different rule about, a uh, different view about rules? I was invited to this pastor's conference. I'm speaking to a group of hundred or so pastors. Okay? For the Convention of Indian East and Baptist Churches. Okay? And in their bylaws it says, pastors must be made. Okay, I don't make their rules, that's their rule. Okay. So, you would conclude, if their bylaws say pastors must be male, then there would be no women pastors. Okay, so I'm up there preaching. I look up there and there's, a, I don't know, seven or eight or nine women. So I sit down next to the EOT, the president of the convention, and I said, uh, I thought only pastors were going to be. He said, yeah. I said, so everybody here are pastors. There's some women in the room. Are they pastors? Yep. Are they called like pastors? Yep. So they do everything pastors do. Yep. Now see, I should have left it alone at that point. I'm American. I can't leave it alone. So I said, but your rule says pastors must be male. Here's what he said. Yes, and most of them are. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, that's a fundamentally different view of rule. Yeah. Because as an American, I would have to change that bylaw to say most pastors must be male. And then we'd argue over the percentage. <laughs> <laughs> they could have a rule that said pastors must be male. And most of them are. Now here's what's interesting. When I read the Bible, the Bible's view of rules look more like his view of rules than look like my view of rules. But, you know, if you don't do that, then it's unfair or broken and God isn't unfair or broken. That's my view of rules, not the Bible's view of rules. I learned it this way. Um, you know, we were always in trouble with immigration. Um, we have been thrown out of some fine companies. But anyway, uh, <laughs> The head of the office, his job was to give the exceptions. So he'd show up about 11, leave about 1. Now that I'm the head of something, I'm thinking, that was really good. <laughs> okay. But um, rules were enforced by all the worker bees. When they needed an exception, that was the boss's job. It's fascinating to me the, the groups that talk about the sovereignty of God the most are the ones who are usually always saying what God can't do. And I tell my students all the time, one of the perks of being sovereign is you get to do what you want. I mean, I think that's kind of like the definition of sovereign. We say, yeah, but God won't do that. I think he does whatever he wants. Um, okay. Let's go deeper. Most Westerners are strong dualists. Now, the Bible doesn't teach dualism, okay? But um, it's rooted in who we are. You know the term dilemma comes from 
die to and lima horns. Okay, um, it is Aristotle spoke about when there's a problem, you're on the horns of the dilemma, um, and uh, that turns us into good Greek duelists. So here we go. Okay, two horns of the dilemma. Oh wait. Uh, uh, horns come in pairs, okay, and they usually have a short tail. <laughs> okay. uh, this is a very subtle part of our worldview. Oh, wait, once you're aware of it, you see it all the time. Whenever we point out an issue, we immediately divide it into two options. As it was. So there's some thorny issue, boom, there are two options. And when we describe them, we usually describe them. On the two opposite ends, the most extreme examples. And we do it, and we do it all the time. Okay. So, um, this uh, gun control, okay, it's a big issue in Texas. So, what are your choices? You take away guns, or you arm everybody? <laughs> well, like, what about the thousand options in between? <laughs> um, uh, abortion, um, you know, you're either pro-choice or pro-life. Um, what about the thousand options in between? I once wrote a blog post and said, what if the Christian position was, let's reduce the number of abortions? Well, who's going to vote against that? Okay, that'd be improvement. Now, before our fist fight breaks out, let's pick something really that's The cosmos. <laughs> that's a little topic. Um, <laughs> we reduce it near the cosmos. You say, well, you can't reduce that to two options. Yes, we do, because we do that. Okay, that's just who we are. Okay? So, the cosmos, we're going to divide it into two, and then we're going to give it rules. Because that's who we are as Westerners. Okay? So, here we go. Universe. We divide it in half. Natural and supernatural, if you're a Christian. You say, well, all right, okay. So, there have to be two. But that's just because that's the way it is. So, all right, there's two, but what else would there be? Because that's the way things really work. Uh, okay, so here we go. You have the natural world, things down here, things in the natural world. And so up there, you've got the supernatural world, or the supernatural things. And for most for many Christians, there's a lion and queen. They don't cross. The only thing that crosses is prayer. <laughs> prayer crosses. God speaks to you through the Bible. But really, they don't cross, okay? Some of you are from more fun denominations, okay? Where um, the line between them is a little, little more porous, okay? Um, uh, Rich works with a group. Woo, they're like the Book of Acts. Okay, and stuff's moving around all the time. There, it's a lot of fun. Okay, but no matter which view, you got two realms: the natural and the supernatural, because that's the way it is. Um, well, all right. So, what are what is the natural stuff? Well, technically, it's things we understand. And therefore, supernatural things we don't understand. You say, well, no, that's not really it. Okay, let's look at an example. Okay, let's discuss lightning. Okay, um, for thousands of years, lightning was here. It's supernatural. It's God's stuff. Okay. Second Samuel 22, God unleashes his arrows, bolts of lightning, to smite me. Psalm which psalm is it? Uh, uh, psalm 18. Lightning are the arrows of God. Great. And then along comes Ben Franklin. Okay. Rascal. Um, now what happened with Ben Franklin? So, for most of you, maybe all of you, lightning is now part of the natural world. So, um, what about lightning actually changed? How, how did lightning change? Nothing changed about lightning. Nothing changed about lightning. What changed? 
Lightning went from things we don't understand to things we understand. Okay? So, the longer the Lord tarries, the more we understand. So what's happening? More and more things are becoming natural. That's all right. Because here's why. For God, you know, He knows how everything works. So for God, there is actually no supernatural. Okay? He understands how everything is natural for Him. So when He sends a messenger, what difference is it between Isaiah and Gabriel? You say, wow, Gabriel's like mega cool. <laughs> From God's point of view, there's no difference between Isaiah, sending Isaiah, or sending Gabriel. You say, well, one supernatural. Well, not the God. He created them both. He knows how they both work. By the way, no difference between sending Isaiah, Gabriel, or the you. The word angel, when we translate angel, is not translated to angelos. It means messenger. So when he sends a messenger, he sends an angel. You know the verse in Hebrews, by entertaining strangers, you entertain angels unaware. That's not like angels sneaking around in the sky. The verse is about hospitality. He's talking about welcoming people in your home. He says, when you welcome them, sometimes you entertain it. An angel. You thought you were hosting a guest when in reality you're hosting someone God sent. Who's going to bring the word to the world. And some of you who practice hospitality have experienced that. Where you welcome somebody and wow, God spoke to them. God sent them to you. One of you earlier was talking about that. He said, Wow, well, God sent me. This was a divine appointment. He'd say, Yeah, they all are. Okay. And they're all angels. Okay. God sent a message. So, um, what's your point? You've been wondering, does he have any point? <laughs> well, surprise! I do. Okay. We know how kidney infections work. Okay. So, we generally don't see God behind you. We know how low pressure systems work. You know? So, we don't... Um, we don't see God in them. Jesus crossing the sea. The storm comes. Okay, They're afraid they're going to die. They wake up Jesus. What does Jesus do? He calms us. He calms us. Okay. But what does the text actually say? He rebukes the wind. Now, you know, how does one rebuke a high pressure system? <laughs> Um, their their heat is either natural or it's super. storms are natural. Um, when he gets across the sea, who's waiting? On the demon possessed man who had been trying to keep him from getting there. Because in the ancient world, demons lived in the sea, spirits lived in the sea, and in the Satan is the prince of the power of the yeah. um, In the Revelation, the beasts come up out of the... So, Jesus commands them into the pigs. Where do the pigs go? Back to the sea. Um, but, it's either natural or supernatural. By the way, the answer the Bible often gives is yes, both. <laughs> so my students ask, is that mental illness, is that supernatural or natural? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> um, here's our problem. Here is the big problem, at least for Americans, typical Americans who grew up with that way. Once we understand how something works, we take God out of it. Oh, is that required? No, but we do it. Now, lightning doesn't have anything to do with God. It's just high pressure system or whatever else. Um, God's not involved in natural things, is kind of our thinking.
we don't ever think like me is God's error. But it's more than that. We want we don't mind if science cures kidney infections and cancer and other stuff like that. Because we've already decided all that stuff's not. We just don't want science investigating anything that we think of as supernatural. Why don't we want scientists solving the problem of origins? Because our worldview would then say we have to take God out. Now we want God involved in creation. We don't want him taken out of that. So the way we solve it is not by saying, hey, Genesis 1 1 says God created the heavens and the earth. As my Old Testament friend says, if you believe Genesis 1 1, everything else in the Bible is cool. Okay? I mean, if God created the heavens and the earth, it's downhill from there. Okay. So uh, that should be our answer. God created the heavens and the earth in this world. But we fall back on our worldview that says, as long as we don't understand it, then God's in it. So we sure don't want to understand how creation happened. Because darn it, then we'll have to take God out. Um, just like we take him out of most humans. All right. Way down here is the subconscious idea that if we ever understand it, we have to take that out. Here's the good news. We don't have to keep everything we inherit from our culture. Just because my culture says, if I understand it, God can't be involved in it, doesn't mean I have to believe that. I believe God can be involved in the most mundane. You know, actually, for him, everything is mundane. So, uh, things that go without being said, they get us in a lot of trouble if we allow them to subconsciously influence themselves. To influence themselves. Things like um, sharing with those in need, even if they haven't worked for them. Here's the question. My, my student who will agonize and will not share with the family. Okay. They'll go on a mission trip to Haiti. And those little rascals will give away everything they have. I have I've had them come back with literally only the clothes they are wearing. They have given away, including their suitcase. They gave away everything. Okay. And I asked them, did you do a little worthiness survey on those people before you gave them away? <laughs> I mean, what if some of them aren't working hard enough? Well, the interesting thing is a little red hit only applies in America. Once you go overseas, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> that one goes away. And all you have left is Jesus saying share. So, ooh, that's just share everything. Okay. <laughs> but they come back on USO, that pops a little red hit again, and then they have to ask worthiness questions. Um, because don't give it to them unless they deserve it. But even, what does grace mean? Yeah, we'll back in. Okay, grace. That's a concordia thing. Um, it means they don't deserve it. So I can leave God in the natural. It's okay. God cured me of cancer. Oh, yeah, there was a surgeon. Okay. Um, if we bring the stuff that's very deep in our worldview, up to the surface, then our Christian faith knows what to do with it. Okay? We know how to scrub it and bring it into line. By the way, the, this is not to get the Easterners off of you got stuff buried in your worldview. Woo! Goodness. Um, and you got to bring that stuff up to the surface. Okay? And then your Christian faith can scrub it. Uh, so, I'm a teacher, so I have to give you homework. <clears throat> First, you need to keep interacting with those of other cultures to become aware of what went without being said. What assumption were you making? What thing did you just assume? Everybody knows that. That gets us in trouble, cross-culturally, all of it. Um, 
And then we can take things that I inherited before I became a believer. Those things in my worldview were planted before I became a believer. When I discover something from my American worldview that doesn't line up with the biblical worldview, I bring it in the line. You know, converting my American worldview to a biblical worldview, there's an old timey word for that discipleship. But if I call it that to my students, they lose interest. Okay. So I say we're here to convert your American worldview to a Christian biblical worldview. Yay! Okay. <laughs> so I don't tell them that's discipleship. But that means all our life we're discovering something. I'm always learning something. I think, oh wow. Oh, I, am doing that. I have an uh, African friend. We begin most conversations with he says, You know what's wrong with you, Americans? <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's usually right. Darn it. Um, but when I bring, when that gets up to the surface, then I can bring every thought captive to the this Lord Jesus, in the end, we want to bring every thought happy to the obedience of Jesus, including the ones that are lurking around subconsciously, that are just assuming, I didn't think about it, I didn't intend that, I didn't mean it, all those things. Those need to be brought into captivity. They need to be under your rule. Thank you for my friends from other cultures who kindly and sometimes not so kindly remind me of things that are not biblical. And I hadn't realized it until they said it. We are salt and light to the world and to each other. I'm grateful for a room full of people who care about that. They care about and they're provoking one another into love and good works. So, Father, may the food that we'll enjoy shortly and the fellowship, may they be used to make us more like Jesus. Because that's what we want. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.